Reduced matrix. Who can explain why we have one free variable in this situation? Just looking at what's on the board here. Why is there one free variable in this matrix? The negative one there is not locked down. So that that doesn't really ha that could be a zero or it could be any other number. It wouldn't change the number of free variables. So that's not the right place to look. It's close to the right place to look. You want to look at how many variables you're supposed to have versus how many columns. So we got three variables, and there's basically two leading non-zero terms. So the two ones are already circled, locked down x, y. So it is, you do look in the third column, but you can see there's no additional uh, number right down there that would have locked down the z variable. So in this case, we got one free variable. Not because of negative one or the zero, but because there was no number in row three to lock it down. So there'll be some homework or some quiz questions that are basically looking at reduced matrix and telling how many free variables you have. So you're going to look, and they'll look somewhat like this, and you just decide how many free variables, zero, one, two, or I don't think there's any more than three free variables on those problems. And there's five questions, only 30 minutes, so you will have to go relatively quickly through your quiz, so don't waste too much time. So we're going to do one more example. I want to do a non-trivial example, so let's jump into four dimensions and get crazy. When we go to four dimensions, I can't use x, y, z because I don't have a letter after z to use, so we're going to use x1, x2, x3, x4. So that's what we're going to default to. I do very wrong here. It's not a linear equation. Yeah, that shouldn't be squared. I just had a writing error. There should be a subscript. All right, so we're going to turn this into a matrix. So do that right now. How many columns should your matrix have? Definitely needs two rows. How many columns? So it's going to need five. Four for the variables, one for the constant. So it's always one more column than your variables. So here's our matrix. Is there anything, any work to do in terms of row operations to uh, reduce this? Or is it as good as it's going to get? Yep. As good as it's going to get right here. So there's no op row operations. So this is already in row reduced echelon form, or RREF. I'll just circle the diagonal. And if you look the triangle below, this one's a little trivial because a triangle, one of the triangles is one element, the other triangle is one element. They're both zero though, so this is as good as it's gonna get. So we have no row operation work to do, uh, but we're supposed to write down the solution. So let's go ahead and do that. I could write out the equations that these two rows correspond to, but they're already written down. So there's really no point to rewrite the exact same things. That would be, normally I would rewrite the, equ write the equations over here, but that's already done for us because we didn't make any modifications, so let's look back. Our solution is supposed to look like x1 equals x2 equals x3 equals x4 equals. So that's our solution. So let's think about that as our goal. I'll write it vertically. So that's what I'd like to write. Looking at our matrix, what variables are free, or what columns are free? X3 
x3 and x4. So we're going to always default to the furthest ones to the right are going to be free. So we got x3, x4 free. So our two free variables are x3 and x4. So for x3, I'm just going to write x3, and x4, I'm going to write x4. They just are themselves. So they can be whatever numbers they want. Once x3 and x4 have a value, x1 and x2 are going to be set or fixed. So how do I figure out x2 for our second line right here, our x2 equals? How do I find x2? Solve for x2 in this in our second equation here. So it, back to our matrix, wherever x2 got locked down, that's where your that equation is where you're solving for x2. So where x2 got fixed, which is corresponds to basically that equation, you're solving for that x2. So that's what we're doing right now. So we have x2 equals negative 3 minus x3 minus x4, and that's our x2. And it should be pretty clear how we get x1. Really similar, just using the first equation there. x1, <coughs> this algebra is easy enough to just do it. So our x1 is going to be 1 plus 2x3. plus x4. So we turned our system into a solution form right here. So that would be one form of the solution. A lot of times you're going to see the letters S and T used. So th these are going to be using uh, alternative solutions. using parameters so you're gonna let x3 equal t let x4 equal s and what we're gonna do is just rewrite x1 and x2 equations so our x1 I'm just copying off the x1 equation that we have uh, that we did before I'll highlight it right here I'm copying that x1 equation and all I'm gonna do is x3 is t, x4 is s. So we have 1 plus 2x3, which is now t, and then plus x4, which is s. And last up, our x2 equation is now negative 3 minus, not x3, but minus t minus s. And I didn't write these in the correct order, so I'll just rewrite x3 at the bottom. x3 is t, x4 is s. So there's our parameterized version. And I'll write one more version, which is the vector version. I like definitely written out vertically, but in terms of vector versus system, um, if I if I care, I'll specify which way I want uh, them written. I always prefer vertical because easier to <coughs> read. But in terms of which vertical, uh, right now it's not so important. So our vector version x1, x2, x3, x4 is one vector, and that equals one plus two t plus s minus 3 minus t minus s t s then I'm aligning my columns when I'm writing this out so I have basically constant first and then one parameter next and then the other parameter next and what that lets me do is expand it out so I could rewrite it as 1 negative 3 0 0 plus <clears throat> now my t 
coefficients are 2, negative 1, 1, 0, t, plus 1, negative 1, 0, 1, s. So that would be the expanded vector form right there. So I could try to draw what the solution looks like, but we're in four dimensions, so my drawing is not going to mean anything really. But if we think about what we're looking at, we have a point. This point is uh, when s and t are zero. This is a uh, fixed point on the solution. We have a our solution is always a linear object, and this one has two uh, degrees of freedom or, or two free variables. So what type of linear object is this? Type of linear object that you can move two different directions on. It'll be a plane. So you can go kind of forward, backwards, or left and right. Now we're in four dimensions, so which one of these is forwards and which one's left and right doesn't matter. We're in four dimensions, but you can go one way or another way. So if I draw a picture of this, here's a point. There's one vector here and another vector here. And the plane is basically the one formed by going in these two directions like that. So just think you have a point on your table and you can go two directions. One of them is kind of forwards and the other one's not forward, some other direction. But you're still on, your, on the table. Of course, this table could be tilted and it's also in four dimensional space. So it's not the best analogy, but that's the best we can really do. All right, so I think that should cover two free variables. From here, it should be somewhat uh, clear how to do three free variables. You would just have another, uh, if you had to use a third letter, I'd probably use R, R, S, T. U, I'd probably avoid using U because we usually use that for vectors, but R would be a good letter to use next. <coughs> So we are going through the textbook, but we're not, I'm not exactly following the order. Uh, so for example, the book talks about different solutions first and then neural operations second. So I did the other order and that's totally, doesn't really matter. talks about inconsistent systems. get into uh, homogeneous systems now. So, good, we have notes in every section. All right, so we're getting into, oh, oh perfect. So let's start with a definition. Uh, I believe this section is only called systems of equations, but of course we're systems of linear equations in linear algebra, so you're going to see the word linear left out a bunch when it should be there. But pretty much anytime you see equation, you're, uh, you're dealing with linear equations. So the real word we have to define is homogeneous here. So what does that mean? In English it means uh, things are the same or very similar. Uh, in math, it has a few different meanings. It usually means equals to zero. So definition, a homogeneous So linear, a homogeneous linear system has all constants zero. So these are not the coefficients, 
but these are the constants written on the right side of the equations. So, for example, 2x1 minus 3x2 plus x3 minus 6x4 equals 0. 4x1 plus x2 plus 2x3 plus 9x4 equals 0. And 3x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus 8x4 equals 0. Now, if we we're going to solve this, so let's go ahead and solve this. We're going to do the same uh, solution uh, method we did before. We're going to turn it into a matrix. So we'll do that first. So we got 2, negative 3, 1, negative 6, 0, 4, 1, 2, 9, 0, 3, 1, 1, 8, 0. No matter which row operations I do, is there any way that the third column would not have a 0 in it? Is there any row operation that somehow would cause a one of these to not be 0? So swap's not going to change it because they're all 0. Adding multiple is not going to change it because you're going to multiply 0 by 0, add it to 0, get 0. And uh, multiplying by a non-zero constant is obviously not going to make 0 not 0. All right, so that entire column is going to stay zeros. What One thing that means is you can be lazy and not write it. So if you want to be lazy and not write it, uh, augmented matrices, you're going to see a line drawn down like that. So if you don't want to write it, that's fine. But you need to make sure you're that you remember that they're actually there. So if we skip writing them, what I'm going to do is just do a vertical bar on the right side, meaning that's that augmented bar, but I'm not going to write the zeros in the closing uh, bracket. So that's my lazy notation for uh, a homogeneous. Just make sure you know, and you can always, you've seen me write this before, you can always write your variables, and then you can write constant right there, just so you don't forget. This is a four variable system, but it's homogeneous, not a three variable system with the third uh, column is con or the fourth column is constants. All right, so this is a good problem to start with because there's no one in column one. So I can't really, there's no one to use. Let's try to avoid fractions as long as possible. How can I get a one in one of these entries here in column one? I don't care which entry turns into a one. What is one row operation I can do to get a one in one of those spots? So I could do, what was that? So I could do negative two row one, what effect will that have? That'll zero out my four. I mean, that's probably a thing I want to do, but first I want to get a one here before I start. So I could subtract row three from row, row one. I could also subtract one, row one from row three. Either <coughs> one will work. Uh, and you can do two op row operations at the same time. So let's actually do that minus two row one. We'll knock out the four, and then we'll do a minus row one to row three to turn our three into a one. And then we'll put the one at the top next. So go ahead, do these two operations.
So any questions on those, the results of those operations? So it's a very good time to talk about handwriting. Let's look at this matrix here, and I'm, all I'm going to do is move the 2 to an ambiguous spot. Well, it's not really ambiguous because we don't write 0, 2. That's not the best example. 2 here. I'll put both of those in. There you go. Is that a 70 in column 2? So you want to be very careful as you line up your digits. So we got a 21 and a, that should have been 0. So make sure you're, anytime you write down two digits, that they're extra close together. So my one on my 14, make sure they're close together. Uh, if you're really uh, worried, you can also uh, turn your paper sideways and you're, you'll get vertical bars instead of horizontal bars, and then you can space things out like that too. So whatever works better. You can even use graph paper if you really want to. Uh, but as long as you're careful, you probably won't have serious problems with this. So go ahead, do the rest of the row operations here. So let's knock out that two first and then we'll do a swap afterwards. So knock that two out, then swap, and do whatever you think you should do after that. And I'll answer any questions you have. Get all the way to the end, rewrite your equations, and you're best to write the answer. I'm going to do two moves at one time here. I'm going to swap two rows and multiply the row. I'm not swapping by a number. I wouldn't recommend doing this, but because they're disjoint operations, the swap's not going to affect that multiplication. So I would recommend don't do what I'm doing for most things, but especially here.
Operation questions. Yep. On the matrix above your final one, you say minus two R one and yeah. for R one. Oh, what did I do there? Maybe it should be a three. Hopefully that's what I did. Yeah, if you subtract a row from itself, you'll get zero. So that Oh no. Oh, it looks like it should. Alright, so let's follow that error through. I'm going to go to green for this. So it should be a negative 6, which changes negative 28 minus 6, negative 30 something, 34. Adding 33 to negative 34, so we get negative 1. Alright, does that work with more of your solutions? Alright, so we got to be careful writing the equations out because <coughs> we have four variables and our constants are 0. So I'm going to rewrite x1, x2, x3, x4, and then constant just so I don't forget. It's a really good idea to do this on the last step, sometimes even the first step. So we have x1 plus x4 equals 0. x2 plus x4 equals, whoa, yeah, equals 0. Wait, 3x4. And last. Yep, that will be 2x4. And our last one's x3 minus x4 equals 0. So let's think about free variables. I'll switch to the blue. So looking down the diagonal, I see that x1, x2, x3 are all locked down. There's only one choice for free, which is x4. So I went through a whole bunch of different ways to do free variables. So the general way I'm going to do it is use a parameter. So I'm going to just use the letter T right here. Let x4 equal T. Now we have x4. And let's go ahead and all right, x4 equals T near the bottom. And then I'll write them in reverse order going up. So I have my x3 equation here. All we need to do is add x4 to the other side. So x3 equals x4. And that is t. So x3 is also t. Now we're going above to x2 is negative 3x4. So x2 is negative 3t. And last we have x1 is negative 2, x4. So x1 is negative 2, t. So if we write, that's one way to write the solution. If I write in vector form, x1, x2, x3, x4 equals, now on the right side we have negative 2, 3, 1, 1. Yes, negative 3. All right, any questions on the work we've done writing our solution? So we have one free variable. What linear object are we looking at? Don't be afraid just because we're in four dimensions. What linear object has a one dimension? A line. So we're looking at a line in four-dimensional space. 
is this line going to pass through the origin, which is the point zero, 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 zero? What t value would pass through that point? Or what t value would give you that point? Zero. So this line passes through the origin. So the solution is a line passing through the origin. I wrote the origin before as uh, zero, meaning the zero in the right dimension. So in this case, we're in four dimensions, so that would be four zeros. So that's what I mean, passing through the origin. So there's a theorem in your, well, there's a lot of theorems in your textbook. A lot of them we have skipped. Uh, I've told you enough information that you can, uh, you don't really need the theorems. You have the background information behind it. Uh, we didn't go and prove things rigorously, but uh, that requires a whole lot of subscripts and messing around with a lot of notation. So I kind of glossed over a lot of that stuff. <coughs> But homogeneous systems you can generally write them out if I use a uh, summation notation. Let's go k equals 1 up to n ak xk equals 0 and remember, what does this actually mean? This is a1 x1 plus a2 x2 plus a n x n equals zero. No matter what the a values are, what combination of x's will always be a solution? What is a guaranteed solution up here? Doesn't even matter what a1, a2 through a n are the origin, or when they're all zero. That only works because you have zero on the right side. If I had 10 over there or any other number, you can't just put in zeros and expect it to be 10. So there is always a solution. Two homogeneous systems. No matter what your coefficients are, you always get the origin as your solution in whatever dimension that your system comes from. So this has a couple consequences. You never have inconsistent if you have homogeneous. You can never see a row of zeros followed by not zero because that last not zero is always zero in a homogeneous system. So the inconsistent is gone. That's not possible to have inconsistent you're guaranteed to get a zero solution. So if you have a single point solution, that means the only solution would be the origin. So if you have a one point solution and you're homogeneous, it has to be the origin. If you have a line, it's a line that contains the origin. If you have a plane, it's a plane that contains the origin. If you have three dimensional linear object, that's your solution, it's still gonna contain the origin. So no matter what type of solution you have, if it's homogeneous, you get the origin and possibly other uh, points. So a guaranteed solution so the solution will contain the origin. Uh, they call this the trivial solution in the book. Good place to end. So we'll talk about null space next, and we'll do that on Monday.